guests together here in God's house. There are several announcements I want to share with you this morning. The first I'll let Tim Baker let us know about. Uh, Tim. Thank you. Um, yes, it uh, mentions in your bulletin that there is a spaghetti lunch today, but there's so much more to it than that. I hope that you will uh, participate, even if you weren't planning to. Change your plans. And, uh, and uh, oh, you got to pull it close. Okay. Change your plans and be part of it because, well, the youth choir is going to Scotland this year to sing concerts in Northern England and Scotland. Um, and so that requires a lot of money, but they're willing to work very hard for that money. Today's dinner includes the following things. One, you can, uh, you can uh, do a auction, silent auction, for football tickets to the UNC State game. UNC UNC State game is coming up here in a few weeks, and they're really, really good seats. They're seats you'll want to have. You can auction those. You can um, um, shop at the tag sale uh, right here in the parlor. And, um, and please check out the stuff. It's excellent. And during the um, spaghetti, uh, while you're eating, not only is your food brought to you by happy, smiling teenagers, but there are a cappella groups from several of our area high schools that will be entertaining you while you eat. So good food, good time, a really good cause. Please join us downstairs right after this service for the spaghetti dinner. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. There are also other announcements that are printed in your bulletin. I hope you'll take time to read those so you know some of what's happening in the life of our church. And next Saturday, there's another fundraiser for our youth group. It's Saturday morning at Applebee's, a pancake breakfast. They're selling tickets after this service also. And uh, as well, this afternoon, I want to remind you that our grief and loss support group begins its meetings. I hope that you will uh, keep in mind that that is a group that runs for several weeks and becomes a very helpful community. Read the details about that and let yourselves or friends know about its existence. Lastly, I would highlight for you that in two weeks, our outreach team, which is the combination of our missions and our evangelism groups, that our outreach team will be leading a conversation for our whole church around mission and how we're re-envisioning being in mission as a congregation. I hope you'll make time for that after worship on October 26th, after the late service. We are a congregation called to love God, to serve others, to build Christian community. That calling is grounded in our worship. So let us now take a moment and prepare our hearts as we worship the Lord.
Please stand as you are able for our call to worship. Like a woman who searches for a lost coin until it is found, as a father receives a returning wayward son, Therefore, let us praise God in thanksgiving that we are received. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of life, we thank you for each person you have placed in this congregation, for the gift you have given to us, and for your grace that makes us saintly. Grant all of us, rich and poor, men and women, young and old, may find fruitful ways to use our gifts for the common good. May our worship today strengthen and encourage us to use our blessings for your holy purposes in this world. This we pray in the name of Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the power of your own spirit. Amen.
hear the good news. While we were weak at the right time, God sent God's Son for us. This proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now, as a forgiven and reconciled people, let us show signs of Christ's peace to one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Please join in the prayer for illumination found in your bulletin. Through your word and by your spirit, O Lord, you speak to your saints. Open our hearts that we may hear and serve you in gratitude and faith. Amen. The letters of Paul are indeed letters. While the Holy Spirit meant for them for all people in all times, Paul wrote them for specific churches and people in his own time. In this section of his letter to the Philippian, Paul urges two specific women, Euhodia and Syntyche, to resolve their differences in belief, a dispute known to them, known to the Philippians, and known to Paul, but not to us. Paul then exhorts the Philippians to give constant thanks to God and to focus their thoughts on all things good. Hear these words from Philippians 4, 1 through 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Euhodia and Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything. Put in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord.
Hear now a reading from the Gospel. From the Gospel of Matthew, the 22nd chapter, the parable of the wedding banquet and the parable of the wedding guests. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. The king sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But the invited guest made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized the king's slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then the king said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the streets and invite anyone and everyone to fi- you find to the wedding banquet. So those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so that the wedding hall was filled with guests. Then when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. The king said to the man, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? The man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, I want to give you an update on my growing daughter. It seems that children are a wonderful source of sermon illustrations for a pastor. My two-year-old is talking up a storm, and I don't know where it came from. Not long ago, it was hi, and hi, daddy, maybe. But all of a sudden, she's throwing phrases out left and right, and they're phrases that we did not intentionally teach her. Her sing-song, high-pitched toddler voice makes these phrases seem as cute as can be. In the morning, when I walk into the kitchen, I hear, Hi, Daddy. Good to see you. And when I send her off to daycare, she blows me a kiss. And she says, Bye, Daddy. Have a nice day. See you in a little bit. (laughs) Where does she get these phrases? They came from us, of course, and from others who surround her and care for her throughout the day. They're the phrases that she hears and receives from others, so she's mimicking them. And their delightful innocence is more than a reason for a parent's oversized pride. Her mimicking grown-up phrases illustrates for this pastor how to learn and to practice faith in Christ. Simply put, we learn faith, we learn what it means to be a disciple of Jesus by following others' example. Whatever is true, honorable, just, whatever is pure, pleasing, commendable, if there's any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things, says the Apostle Paul. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, he says, and the God of peace will be with you. This is what Paul tells the church at Philippi. It's the epistle reading for today, and it's much more palatable than the gospel reading I just read. Paul offers himself as an example of a person who follows Jesus. Keep on doing the things that you have received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. 
We modern people like to think of ourselves as autonomous individuals, as folks who have to decide their fate, as people who choose between competing paths each and every day. But in truth, life is often simply walking the path that is set before us, staying true to that one direction. My daughter is not a child genius who thinks up these comments on her own. Well, she is a child genius. (laughs) But, But she's not thinking up these phrases in a vacuum. She's emulating others. She's simply walking the path that is set before her. And that is discipleship in a nutshell. If we want to grow closer to Jesus, we follow the path of other people who are trying to do the same. Growing in Christ is not a solo endeavor. Paul asked those in Philippi to copy him and he fo- as he follows Jesus, and then he asks them to follow Jesus together. My brothers and sisters, stand firm in the Lord in this way, he says. Be of the same mind in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul asked the church in Philippi to follow Jesus together so that what they hold in common, before there are any differences among them, what they first and foremost hold in common is Christ the Lord. When Paul speaks of the mind of Christ, the word translated as mind is more accurately translated as center of being. We might say heart rather than mind. Have the heart of Christ. Love like Christ. In fact, that's more of the language that Paul used earlier in his letter when he said, Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Perhaps that sounds like something only saints of God can do. Well, that's good news then, because we are saints. You and me. We are saints. We refer to saints as those who connect better to God than the rest of us. We put saints on a pedestal too high for us to knock them down even. But that's not what saints are at all. Scripture's clear. Saints are not people who love or serve God better than others. Rather, all Christians are saints. Paul never suggests saints are people who follow Jesus perfectly He only describes saints as people who follow Jesus, period. Be of the same mind, not necessarily of the same opinion, but the same way of love. John Wesley, the Anglican priest who started the Methodist movement hundreds of years ago, said it this way, Though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike. May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion. Without all doubt, we may. And herein, all the children of God may unite, notwithstanding smaller differences. The saints of God are everyday people who generously share with others the blessings that we have received from God. And there are everyday examples of sainthood all around us. They've been in this church for decades, for generations. Some have gone on to join that heavenly cloud of witnesses. Older members of our church will remember Mary Henley, Mary who appointed herself greeter and stood at the door every Sunday she was here. 
I know of her generous spirit from all those who knew her, since I never got to meet her myself. But I'm assured that regardless of political affiliation or academic achievement or even athletic allegiance, when you walk through those doors, you were Mary's interest and the love of God embraced you. She was generous with her funds as well. She started an endowment with her estate that funds the speaker here every year, the Mary Henley Lecture Series that happens mostly in Advent. There are others who have shaped and formed us, who have helped set an example. Sarah Palmer Haynes was a wonderful member of United Methodist Women who was generous with her own spirit. She'd call you up and she wouldn't ask if you were baking anything for the bazaar. She'd call and ask what you were baking for the bazaar. It was her way of involving you, not manipulating, but letting you know immediately you are one with others. And so many of us remember Sarah West Campbell, who sat on one of these front rows, and who I'll never forget, as loving and as unconventional as she could be, when she came up and I served her communion for the very first time, she reached up and grabbed my cheek and pulled me down and gave me a kiss. <laughs> Highly inappropriate, but I was a fan. <laughs> The love of God shapes us, forms us, and we are examples to other saints, whether we know it or not. God uses us when we seek to follow in the steps of Jesus. Not perfectly, but simply to follow, to do our best, if we saints do not claim the name saint, then we are like the wedding guest in Matthew's parable. Now remember, parables are stories that pull us into them. Matthew's parable of the wedding banquet is essentially two parables. The first is the story of the king's wedding feast. This story is Matthew's embellishment of Luke's telling of Jesus' parable. In Luke, Jesus tells the story of a man who held a feast, and that is all. But Matthew adds that the man is a king, and Matthew adds what would be by our today's standards just normal, everyday, movie-going affairs, ridiculous violence. I think those details distract our modern ears. At the heart, the story concerns a host who is generous. He is so generous, he wants as many people to not only to attend, but also to enjoy the party. But what happens to the guest who doesn't wear that wedding garment? That's unique to Matthew. No other gospel contains that story. It's a second surreal parable. The host throws the guest out of the party. It seems to contrast with the character of a generous host. By what standard is this king determining who is welcome? After all, he's given instruction to bring everyone in, the good and the bad. One thing to remember as you read the Gospel of Matthew is that all of these judgment parables that we've come to here, the chapters in their 20s, they hearken back to the Beatitudes, to chapter 5 to Jesus' vision of the blessed community, the peaceable kingdom, where those who are meek and those who mourn, where those who are persecuted, where those people are the people that God preferences. It is in support of them, it is in support of that vision of the blessed community that all the judgments are made in these judgment parables later in the gospel. And so the king has his reasons, the king has the idea, has the vision, has the duty to mold the peaceable kingdom. The wedding guest who doesn't wear the wedding garment, 
he's called out. And rightfully so, because in this day and age, the wedding garment is given by the king, by the host. To wear the garment is to follow the king. It's to support the celebration. It's to participate in the party. Not to wear the garment is to abuse the king's generosity. To use it for one's own ends. The wedding guest. The wedding guest actually ends up going his own way. Doing his own thing. Even the midst, in the midst of all the generosity around him. He only needs to receive the host's blessing to show that he has joined fully the party. But he doesn't. I wonder why. After all, it's not what we do that makes us saintly. It's who we follow that makes us saintly. We don't have to come up with anything new or different to be good Christian people. We simply have to do what Jesus has done. As Paul encourages us, treat others as better than ourselves. Remember the blessings God has given us and share them with others. But we can navel gaze, can't we? we can become so preoccupied with our worthiness or unworthiness that we forget this party is not in our making. This is the party of the Master, of the Lord. I remember the years I was in seminary, as years of a lot of personal reflection, it seemed that the others in my class were so sure of where they were headed and how God had called them, and I wasn't as much. I lived for those years with several housemates who I'll get to see tonight and tomorrow and Tuesday, the first time we've all been together in 20 years at Duke Divinity School's convocation. There was Daniel. He was sort of the hub of the wheel of that little group the intellectual whose studies were not and are not propelled simply by a love of knowledge. But first and foremost, they were propelled by a love of God and a love of God's people. That's why he's a professor of Christian ethics now out in Colorado. There was Eric, the college basketball player whose good looks and athletic strength made him stand out from the rest of us who Eric, Eric could have done all sorts of things with the gifts he was given, but he understood that Christ doesn't use our strengths, Christ uses our weaknesses to make us witnesses of his grace. That's why Eric serves one of the larger churches in Wilmington right now. There was John, the Chicago boy, who needed me to translate when we stood in the gas station and talked to the attendant and he couldn't understand the southern twang. John, the Chicago boy whose music and quick laughter were evidence of his easygoing nature. He understood from the beginning that service to God is not an obligation or a sacrifice, but ultimately a joy. And that's why his peers elected him chair of the Board of Ordain Ministry in his conference in Illinois. But me, in the midst of that little group, I was always the one who remained uncertain about his call, whether I was worthy enough to serve the Lord. I was so uncertain that when it came time for our last year of seminary, I took the year off. I kept living with the guys, but I started meeting with the spiritual director and talking about my call. And what I learned in that year is that fretting over one's unworthiness was a way of not focusing on God, but focusing on oneself. I came to accept my saintliness, not from looking in the mirror, and not even from looking at my housemates. I came to accept my saintliness because I saw Christ show up in my housemates. 
and in the church that raised me, and in the church that called me. That's what makes us saints. Not when we look in the mirror and see ourselves, not when we turn to our friends or even our enemies and see them. What makes us saints is when we turn to our friends and our enemies and we allow ourselves to see Jesus who shows up. If we but attend the party fully prepared, for all that he will do. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us join together in the affirmation of faith that's found in your bulletin. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of glory and God of grace, you are indeed faithful. We praise your name for our 10,000 blessings and all those um, besides. Lord, we come to you today with many things in our hearts and in our minds, and we know that you will be faithful in hearing them. We pray for the peace of the world, for the welfare of our universal church, and for the unity of all people. Lord, in your mercy. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all those in authority, we pray. Lord, in your mercy. For Chapel Hill, Carborough, and all the surrounding communities, and for those who live in them, we pray that you hear the cries of their hearts and the offerings of their thanks and praise that they lift up to you now. Lord, in your mercy. For those who struggle in their marriage relationships, and for those for whom love is a stranger. Enter into those places with your perfect love. Guide them to see themselves and others as you see them. Lord, in your mercy. For those in the hospital or recently released, we ask for your healing touch, Lord, especially for Beverly Harn and Barbara Evans. And Lord, each week someone in our congregation writes on their prayer card and they ask, us to pray for all the babies that are hospitalized in our community and we thank you for that persistence of prayer may all of us be inspired to pray so faithfully for the innocent lord in your mercy lord we give you thanks for patrick morris who was present in worship today we have prayed for him here in our sanctuary and we give you thanks for hearing that prayer and enabling him to join with us today. Lord, in your mercy. For those nearing the end of life and for their families and caregivers, especially for Marjorie West Ray and her family, we ask that your grace be su sufficient to release all anxiety. And for all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, and for all those struggling with grief and loss, and those who minister to them, particularly those who will be gathering for mutual support this afternoon at our church, we pray, Lord, in your mercy. And we give thanks for those who you have brought together in marriage and ask your continued blessing on them. For Stephanie Finkbeiner and Jonah Bishop, married last night in our church, and Allison Walker, sister of Brittany White, who was married last night to David Moore. For this communion of saints worshiping at University United Methodist Church, guide us to commend ourselves and one another and all of our life to you. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord our God, accept these prayers of your people. Look with compassion on us and on all who turn to you for help, for you are gracious. And to you we give all glory 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And now we pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father. Amen. Sisters and brothers, God is good. And all the time. God is good. Well, there is much for us to celebrate in the life of the church, and I invite you to the back of your bulletin to learn more about how you can connect and ways in which you can be involved. And also remind you there's a lot going on in the West Parlor with our youth and on beyond that to the fellowship hall with the spaghetti dinner after worship. I invite you to that as well. If you are seated in the inside of the pew row, I invite you to take the fellowship pad and to hand it down. That fellowship pad, you may or may not have noticed in the past few weeks, has been redesigned a little bit. So if you are a regular attender or a member, you can put, and if given us your information that you would like to give us, put your name there at the top. There's a list of just a name, and you can go underneath of that real quick. But if you're a visitor, we are so glad you're here, and we invite you to fill out that Hard with more information so we might know more about you, how to connect with you, how we might get you connected to the life and ministry of our congregation. So pass that down. We can greet one another by name at the end of our worship service. In front of you is a little yellow card. That's a prayer card. You can put a prayer request down, and as Mitzi acknowledged in her prayers, we pray for those as staff, as pastors, and throughout our prayer teams, and he, even here during our prayers of the people. And you can hand that prayer in the offering play as it comes by, and we can be in prayer with you and alongside you throughout the weeks to come. I'm going to invite now uh, Christy Smith and Joe Flora to come and give us a word of celebration for our stewardship campaign. Grace and peace from the co-chairs of the 2015 Pledge Campaign at University United Methodist Church. Christy Smith and I, Joe Flora is my name, are honored and humbled to be part of this annual effort. Were he not away for his parents' weekend at his daughter's college, Adam Broom would be standing here with us. He's the one who directs the team that does all of the heavy lifting. Think of Christy and me as the link between them and you. Christy is wife, mother, teacher, dedicated disciple. Today, she launches the campaign. Good morning. I want to thank Joe for that very generous introduction, and I'll admit up front that I am nervous about introducing our stewardship campaign. It feels like a big responsibility because I love this church. I love the work it does in our hearts, our town, our neighboring university, and in the larger world. I want to do a good job of emphasizing the importance of these pledge cards. I want to do a good job of articulating the campaign themes and goals. At first glance, the goals appear fairly simple. Basically, we want to fund a budget that can, one, provide for our commitments here at home, and two, provide for others as a church in mission. That should be easy for me to detail, right? I mean, look at the first one. It's basically saying, let's pay our bills. But in reality, it's more complicated. In preparation for today, I had the privilege of learning more about how our budget works, about what's included under that budget umbrella and what isn't. I learned that the essential, please keep them coming contributions we provide to ministries through fundraisers or earmarked donations, serve those programs in critical ways without putting a dent in the budget that is their foundation. 
Ministries like the choir tour, steeple fund, youth mission work, and our children's program rely on those earmarked contributions. But those ministries also rely on the budget that houses, staffs, supplies, and provides them and other ministries with so much more. To support them fully, we have to support the budget. Cue the refrain, please consider making a pledge. Our second goal is to provide for others as a church in mission. Certainly we're all on board with that. But the reality is that to meet our mission goals, particularly those goals involving children and families, we need to do more. Throughout this campaign, you will learn about amazing programs our church currently sponsors. But today, I have been tasked with telling you that the people served by these programs need more than occasional offerings. They need people to commit more assistance. They need a church to put something for them in the budget. Cue the refrain, please consider making a pledge. I told you I was nervous, and I'm afraid to look at Carl to see how I'm doing with this. Honestly, I have been afraid to look at him ever since he told me that I was supposed to introduce a campaign theme entitled Everyday Saints. Prior to Carl's sermon today, I am pretty sure no one has ever referred to me as a saint. Was Carl nervous in that first meeting when his campaign spokeswoman heard the word sainthood and asked for a working definition of the term? Maybe. Or maybe he wanted a public pupil up here, someone who needs to learn more about everyday saints who live life so aware of their abundance that their gratitude for it becomes a font of generosity. I get the gratitude part, and upon reflection, I realize how gratitude does inspire giving. I mean, it's my gratitude for this community that convinced me to give three minutes of my time today. I realize that is a pitifully ex small example, but it's a start for someone who was just called a saint for the first time during this morning's sermon. And it has inspired me to ask the hard campaign question, which is, can I do more? Can I count more of my blessings, living more gratefully? Can I give more out of my bounty, leading a truly generous life? Can I continue to support individual ministries and find more somewhere for the budget those ministries rely on? These are the big questions, and I will let them linger as I officially say, welcome to your fall stewardship campaign. Please consider making a pledge. Joe and I both thank you. Thank you, Joe and Christy. And I'll be the second to say that you are truly living saintly lives by offering your time, as all of us are here with our presence as well as our witness. So let us give back to God our tithes, our offerings, and our very selves.
as you prepare to receive this benediction and as we prepare as part of the benediction to sing the sung response that is printed in your bulletin. I have to share a story. When I drove in this morning, I noticed the flags that fly on the street now after a momentous week in the civic life of our state. I remembered a story, I remembered an experience last spring when I visited with a wonderful couple in our church, a couple who've been here for generations, a couple who have ministered to others not only out of their strength, but also out of their weakness, out of their pain. I was visiting in their home, we were talking about differences that they felt were present between them and me politically. It was a wonderful conversation undergirded by all the hospitality that they show not only in their home but also everywhere they are. In the midst of that conversation I got a phone call. It was from my wife. She had hit her head and had received a concussion. She wasn't really even making sense. I had to apologize. I had to rush out of the house. had to go be with her. She was only about five minutes away. When I got to Stacy and we assessed the situation and found Amalia safe with her, all of a sudden, not even a minute after I'd arrived, the same couple, unbidden, was there to love, to care for me, for Stacy, for Amalia. I remembered that story as I drove in today, for we are a blessed congregation. God does have his judgments. God does preference the meek, those who mourn. God does preference those who are persecuted. God does preference those who are peacemakers. All of the Beatitudes are God's vision of that blessed community. But we know that in life we have different opinions of how to get to that blessed community. And there are some here who are overjoyed at the flags and others who are keeping quiet. Those are civic matters. I rejoice that it is not our judgment, but God's ultimately. And that God in his grace will judge all of us. And that we, as God's community, are a community who above all, differences aside, love one another the way we feel Christ asks us to love. Saints of God, continue to love one another and go into the world this day to love unconditionally in following together our Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.